Welcome to Strange Paradigms. In this weekly show, we'll be taking a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, weird, and mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. The topics we cover are fascinating, while some are unnerving and others disturbing, but definitely show that we live in a strange world full of strange mysteries. The idea is for you, the viewers, to be able to offer your thoughts and input on the stories that we cover in the live chat. Each news item that we go over in the show, I will place all the links in the description box below once this show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Please make sure to share this video with anyone or groups or forums for those who you think will be interested. The growth of this channel has a lot to do with you, my wonderful viewers and listeners. My guest today and my co-host is John Russell, psychic medium author and paranormal researcher let's bring him in john how are you my friend hi christina it's so good to see you so good to be with you co-hosting the show this is so exciting i can't wait we have a ton of good <laughs> stuff to talk about we definitely do and with the background that you have i was very specifically looking for articles that i'm thinking john's gonna love this he's gonna love this oh my gosh he's gonna love this <laughs> one we need to cover them all <laughs> absolutely absolutely how have you been oh gosh i've been so well i mean everything yeah. is is good i'm like in the brain that we're getting here on the west coast but how are you Before we i'm doing good i'm uh, i'm kind of excited about what's happening in the future for the paranormal for ufology for a lot of things because there's a lot of people that are pushing for something serious now for real disclosure. And I love the shows that you're doing because you're bringing things out to the forefront, bringing things to people's attention in a realistic manner, giving people food for thought, giving people things to think about. You're interviewing a wide variety of people. You're covering a great variety of news stories here that it's important that people have these at least as talking points, whether they believe or not. That's what the what's what my channel is all about is just to yeah. make people think outside of the box. You don't have to believe what I say because a lot of the things that I cover, I don't always believe it, but it's it's food for thought, just like Absolutely. you said. Absolutely. So, so because you are my guest co-host today, I'll let you pick the first article that you want to cover. Oh my, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about the serial killer Eileen Wernos and uh, mm. her uh, haunting the last resort bar. So why why is this bar significant to you personally? Well, being a biker and being a biker since the age of 15, an old school biker, I have been to the last resort bar several times. And uh, when I was at the, uh, the very first time that I went to the last resort bar with some friends of mine, when you go in the door, you can go to the right and there's an air conditioner on the wall there, kind of down lower there was. And uh, I actually, I don't remember if I left my initials, but I put motorcyclist, M-O-T-O-R-P-S-I-C-L-I-S-T. <laughs> motorcyclist is in psychic motorcyclist, uh, psi phenomena motorcyclist. So if you go to the uh, last resort bar and look over around that area, you'll see my signature on the wall there. Everybody goes in and, and signs the wall, signs the bar, signs everything. So uh, my signature is there. And uh, of course, that's where Eileen Wernos, the, the infamous female serial killer, hung out was at the last resort bar. And that's where she was arrested. And supposedly uh, a teaspoonful of her ashes are scattered there at the bar. Now, I don't know that to be a fact, but that's what the scuttlebutt is. I know that a friend of hers, when she was cremated, she got the ashes and took them up to her home uh, up north and scattered the ashes under a tree there. And uh, so I don't know if, if there's truth to the rumor that somebody got some of the ashes and scattered them at the, uh, at the last resort, but it would certainly be a possibility. But at any rate, uh, I think that the tremendous energy that uh, Eileen would have left there, would have projected there. Yep, there it is. I've been there many times. And, uh, you know, that's when you have that dynamic of force of a spirit, uh, they leave an energy behind and then they could be attracted again 
to that place that they were, where they felt so comfortable and where they spent so much time and uh, where they had, uh, you know, some camaraderie, some sense of camaraderie for herself. And the report is that, uh, you know, since she has died and, and was executed and uh, supposedly some of the cremains are there, that people experienced all type of paranormal phenomena there that they relate to her and to her spirit being there. And I wouldn't doubt that a bit. And uh, uh, when I can, uh, I hope to go over there. Uh, maybe I can go over there and conduct my own paranormal investigation. And uh, that would be a blast if I could get in there, talk to the owners and get in there and uh, take in some cameras and record some things, conduct my investigation, see what I pick up there. That'd be a lot of fun. So that may be a future project for me. I would watch that in a heartbeat. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll be honest with you, I wasn't too familiar with Eileen's story of, of what happened mm -hmm. and what she did. And I'm yeah. pretty sure I'm not the only one. So I do want to mention that she had murdered six men that because mm -hmm. she was a... Um, a prostitute or prostitute. an escort. So yeah. this this was like kind of a, her, her job was to be with people, right? And it turns out that according to the Miami News Times on January 8th, 1991, Eileen, she was 34 years old at the time, had just been dumped by her girlfriend and was too broke to afford a $15 flop at a Hot Sheets motel, but she did have enough money to buy some beer. And it seems that that was kind of the last place that people saw her as she was arrested right there. Then yeah. in 2002, she was executed via lethal injection. And that's kind of where this paranormal activity began to happen right. at her favorite place to hang out. And right. what you mentioned that I found really uh, peculiar, and it's also mentioned in the article by Toronto Sun, is that at least allegedly that some of her ashes are are placed in the back they were like sprinkled on a tree and my question is was that placed in her will or something to be there was it just someone saying like oh this was her favorite spot let me just kind of sprinkle some ashes because i mean if if i owned the joint i would not <laughs> i would not do that <laughs> Well, you know, I think, and, and again, that's rumor, and, and I would like to talk to the owner and find out if that is indeed the case, and uh, and I may try and do that in the future, and, and if they're receptive, I may try and conduct my own paranormal investigation there. But uh, yeah, Eileen hung out there a lot, apparently, and that's where she was arrested. Uh, she was given the lethal injection in Stark, Florida. There's a prison in Stark, and that's where uh, she... Um, uh, hides and grows long grass so she was a people person <laughs> well I guess in some ways she was um and so she was uh, given the lethal injection in stark florida there's a big prison there in stark and that's where she was executed and uh, she had a um a friend that uh and uh, she was also this friend was interviewed on a documentary on tv and she was friends with eileen up until the very end they exchanged a lot of letters photographs drawings and things and it was she that got Eileen's cremains, took them back up north to where she lived, and then sprinkled them beneath a, a tree there where she said Eileen could finally get some rest and get some peace. But it's a, it's a very interesting thing. And I think that um, my feeling psychically is that the entire truth about the matter has never come out. I don't think that we know the entire complete story about Eileen Warnos. And I think there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of digging there yet to be done, a lot of facts yet to come out. And from those letters that were placed back and forth between her and her friend, uh, did it give an example or, or at least a demonstration of who Eileen was and like her personality traits? Was she genuinely a nice person? I mean, how is she described? Because I know that there was a movie about her that I literally yeah. just found when doing the research for today's show. I have never watched it. Mm -hmm. But can you kind of give us what she was like from your understanding? Well, you know, she had a, a very, um, a very disturbed childhood a very problematic childhood and seemed like to be one of these people that just could never make ends meet and the pieces fit and never fit into society. And she always craved love and attention. And uh, I think that uh, I don't know that anybody has the story completely right yet. I mean, there's no denying she did what she did, but I'm not sure that anybody has the story completely right yet 
with a connection with her lover and so on and so forth and the motives of certain things. And uh, this friend of hers uh, didn't take up for her, you know, her actions, but she did say that Eileen was an intelligent person, a creative person, an artistic person, and, uh, and that she could be a very kind person, could be a very loving person. So there's those two distinct sides there. And I don't think anybody's fully researched or fully understands. Was she pushed to that? Was she drawn to that? Uh, you know, nothing, whatever the explanation is, it doesn't excuse her actions. It doesn't excuse her murdering these people. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and Eileen has always maintained that it occurred in self-defense. And then supposedly when she got in jail and was interviewed, she said, I'd kill and I'd kill again. You can't let me out because I'm too much of a danger. So, you know, who knows? There's There's been a lot done, uh, a lot of investigative reporting and a, and a lot of interviews and things, but I still don't think we've quite gotten down to the bedrock yet when it comes to Eileen Warnos. And even when it comes to this paranormal activity at this bar that she frequented at often, even then we're still not fully sure if it is her, but a lot of the co-workers mm -hmm. that are working there currently uh, do believe this to be true. And yeah. what one quote is from uh, the article is that around Oktoberfest, there was a Dollar Tree skeleton and the arm would always be missing. It kept falling off and people would mm -hmm. find it in really weird places. But here's the thing. It was always the left arm, right. by the left arm. Well, it's believed that that was the arm that she had the lethal injection Correct. so that's kind of where there there is that type of maybe this correlation, entity yeah. this correlation has to do with eileen right. but there's another one stating that uh one worker there says she really likes to mess with me when i'm airbrushing all mm -hmm. of a sudden the airbrush goes off and when it's you know on on mid-air and i say eileen let it go <laughs> <laughs> right right and so it, you know and of course Every place is haunted, as I've always maintained, and there could be lots of other spirits, lots of other entities there, and who knows what the energy that Eileen emanated while she was there in the flesh, who knows exactly. what that stirred up, and who knows what was on that property beforehand, and so there could be a lot of other uh, spirits, a lot of other entities and things there, but it does merit a good, serious paranormal investigation. So, again, that, that might be a future... Uh, future project for me down the road. Well, as soon as you post it on YouTube, I'm I'm going to be that first viewer. I want to watch go. that. Well, if you get the RV, maybe I'll meet you there. We'll do the investigation together. <laughs> All right. Ramen's on me. Jessica, there you go. thank you so much for the RV fund. And um, Wood says Dollar Tree Skeleton. Yes, it's like a dollar store. And there's probably like a they, they sell I decorations depending on the holiday. Right. So from like the Dollar Tree, it's like, you know, it's cheap. You know, it's going to like fall apart and stuff. <laughs> probably made out of but, paper. But always the left arm. But always the left arm. That is the key point to this whole right. event right. when it came to, to Oktoberfest. So very so, interesting. Yeah. It, it is. I think when we're dealing with anything paranormal, regardless of if you believe ghosts or not, there are just some things that simply cannot be explained. Like, for instance, again, the left arm was always found in really obscure places. Like, we right. never knew what was going on. But another really weird thing that I want to talk about is going to be our next article. And that's dealing with really weird weather phenomena. Yeah. <laughs> this one, this one was super weird. And I'm green trying, sky. exactly. I'm going to pull up a picture for those know exactly what we're talking about, because this gives me Wizard of Oz vibes. Tell me it doesn't give you those kinds of vibes, John. Now, I grew up in West Texas at the southern tip end of Tornado Alley. And I've read reports, scientists say that Tornado Alley is actually shifting as the years go by. But where I lived then, I was in the southern tip end of Tornado Alley. And I have seen more than once the sky turn green no. when we were having tornadic activity or really severe thunderstorms. So wow. that is a common weather phenomenon when there's severe weather. I've seen the sky turn green and I've seen it greener than that. I've seen it like a bright, bright emerald green. Um, 
And the first time I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, it's the end of the world. And then, uh, I, I came to find out that that's a common phenomena in severe weather is for the sky to turn green. So uh, not necessarily anything supernatural about it, although there could be. I don't know. But it is a common phenomenon in severe weather, and I've encountered it more than once. For, for yourself, how long did that green tint last? From oh, your knowledge, long time it was uh, really, yeah. I observed it one time for about half an hour, 45 minutes. Wow, that is a long time. I mean, yeah. I, I could have imagined to be like a few minutes, maybe like 10, 15 minutes, but an yeah. hour and a half is is extensive. And I feel that for those that are not um, knowledgeable on, on things like this, yeah, you would instantly think we're dealing with an apocalypse, we're dealing with like a, right. the end right. times kind of thing. But for yourself, now that you've experienced quite a few times and that there are articles on it really going into detail of what's going on and why it happens. Right. It does make going through life a little bit easier. And as I say, and as the most famous quote is probably on the planet, and that is knowledge is power, right? right. If you're not, right. if, 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 ignorance is not bliss here. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. And I remember when I very first saw this, uh, we were, in a, a very dangerous stormy condition there in West Texas. And uh, my neighbor had a storm cellar. And of course he had, had come out and looked at the sky. He said, oh, you know, okay, if you need to run over here and get in the storm cellar, you know, because when the sky looks that way, that's many times precursor to a tornado or, uh, you know, really severe winds, damaging hail, any time of that thing. Yeah, big hail. Um, so uh, we always, when we always really kept a close eye on the skies when it turned green like that. And uh, I've seen all kinds of other weird weather phenomenon <laughs> living there in West Texas. I've seen the rain fall down and stop about 20 feet above the street and blow sideways or blow in a circle. Go in a circle. I've seen hail blow straight sideways. The winds were so strong. Uh, so I've, I've seen all kinds of bizarre weather things. Happen. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, this type of phenomenon is is not incredibly that rare because it even right. has a name and it's yeah. called a derecho. So and this is this is mostly unique to like the, the Midwest and the Great Plains states, right. but it, it's not too rare where people just don't know what's going on. So yeah. when I came across this, I'm thinking. Is this how the Wizard of Oz got their got their inspiration? From? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> has to be. <laughs> and you know, you, you talk about that. You know, a lot of people not being familiar with it. I was up in my thirties before I saw my first green sky event. Even though I'd lived in West Texas my entire life, and I was up in my thirties before I saw that. And then I was privileged or not <laughs> to see it several more times. Uh, so that was some of the bizarre weather phenomenon I saw there in Texas. So, yeah, it's uh, uh, there's a lot of people familiar with the green skies. Yeah. Now I want to see one. I, I, this is news to me. I did not know this was a, a naturally occurring thing. So now I want to just travel and, and look for one specifically. Be like the um, like tornado hunter or something, but not with tornado, just for green skies. Well, they, they usually skies. occur around tornadic activity or, or thunderstorms that are so severe that you don't want to be there. <laughs> That is true. And and they had mentioned that in the article that they were dealing with hundred mile per hour winds. Right. right. That's insane. Like I, I couldn't even imagine trying to stand there and I'll be blown away like a sheet of paper. Yeah. And, and when you see skies like that, like in, growing up in West Texas, I've seen baseball and softball size hail. Uh, they get grapefruit size hail there in places sometimes. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's not something you want to experience. Trust me. No, and, and if you see this, you better run the other way because I exactly. have heard that it, it is Get a precursor to some <laughs> very violent tornadoes. Yeah. yeah. So, but see, there, there. I mean, I, I have read some articles that say that if you do see green skies, you better run for the corner because yeah. you you know if something bad's going to happen. The same Get thing that if you can, you know, that's, right. that's the best thing to do. It's the same kind of thing as that if you're at the beach and you see the water receding a little too much. Get out of there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Tsunami's coming. Yeah, tsunami's coming. So get out of there. Exactly <laughs> right. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's really funny because growing up in West Texas, you know, we have all these cliches, uh, a lot of memes you see on Facebook and things like that where 
people in Texas are going out to watch the tornado or this, something, the other. And they actually do. They really do. I mean, there's, there's people that will hunker down or get in the basement or, you know, get in a, a shelter out in the yard or whatever. But there's a lot of people that go, oh, tornado, where is it? And they'll go outside and, you know, stay out there as long as they can before the thing comes. It's like, okay, really crazy. But people yeah. actually do that. I have witnessed people do that in Texas, yes. I mean, they everything's bigger in Texas. There you right? go. So that's, that's I, I don't know how that's relevant, but I just feel like I needed to say that in there. Deranged, there you thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> so about two weeks ago, Luis Jimenez and I covered a, an article talking about a vampire kit that went for auction. Well, it was just sold, and it was sold for almost 16 thousand dollars six yeah. times the asking price and i'm going to yeah. share what this kit looks like because i'm, I'm not going to lie it's it's pretty intriguing it's so a take a look at this slaying kit oh my goodness you've got your so crucifix you've got your mallet with the cross to drive in the stake uh, you've got all these other good assorted implements and things to uh, to slay the vampire to make sure the vampire stays dead yeah. And I think there's probably books there that, you know, were holy prayers or rites of exorcisms, rituals or, or something. And, uh, and of course, you see the stake there and the mallet to drive the stake in with. And, uh, the, yeah, this, these, were, uh, these were very serious things. Now, we don't know if they were constructed by a huckster to sell to the superstitious. A huckster? Like, like yeah, a con like yeah, like a con con artist, you know, so, oh, okay, well, people believe in this. Well, here's your vampire selling kit for <laughs> you know, X amount of money. Now, we don't know if it was that. We don't know if it was someone that did believe in vampires and said, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to uh, construct a vampire killing kit here. And there's the pistols, the silver bullet. You see the holy water flasks, all that good stuff. Um, so we don't know if it, it was an item, you know, originally made by a huckster. We don't know if it was made by someone with a real serious belief, uh, but we do know they existed. We do know people bought them. And uh, so then we go into the, the arena of are vampires real? And uh, it looks to me like over there by the, the crucifix in the lower right, it looks like a mirror. I'm not real sure, but that would be used to determine if a person was a vampire or not because vampires don't cast a reflection. So if you couldn't see the person in the mirror, ah, vampire, get out the gun, get out the holy water, get out the stake and the mallet and boom. <laughs> so, uh, but my question is, if, if a vampire really had that power, uh, would you be able to use this kit on them? I guess you'd have to find them sleeping during the day when they were kind of catatonic, comatose, whatever, and, uh, and then do them in that way. Because otherwise you're facing this great supernatural power. Exactly. So that leads me to the question to ask you, John, and those in the live chat, what do you think about vampires or is or is or is there anything uh, to the history or legends? I mean, what do you know about vampires from your research? Well, look, you know, we've got uh, at Skinwalker Ranch, they say they have seen things that can be described as werewolves. Um, there have been reports of werewolves various other places. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of vampires has been around for quite some time. Um, I, I, at this stage of the game, it's a subject that I'll say I don't believe one way or the other, but I will say I have personally experienced and seen enough strange things in my life that I wouldn't put it beyond the realm of, of, of uh, possibility. Uh, if we can have Bigfoot, uh, if we can have portals open on the Skinwalker Ranch and werewolves the key and, word. and things come through, well, okay, maybe vampires, you know. I, uh, I I didn't believe in fairies until I saw one, and I saw a winged fairy fly over my house. And so take that, make of it what you will, but I saw it with my own eyes. And so it was like, okay, I had to change religions because there it was. I saw it, bingo. <laughs> Um, so are vampires real? Were vampires real? I don't know, but I wouldn't put it beyond the realm of possibility simply because of all the research and things that have been done like at Skinwalker Ranch and other places. And they have alluded to werewolves 
and uh, various entities, supernatural entities like that at these places. So yeah, maybe. And, and that's why it makes at least myself wonder about this kit that went for auction. Was it a clever hoax or a fake? Right. I mean, it, it almost seems too good to be true. And the previous owner, for those that didn't catch the article two weeks ago, was owned by Lord Haley. And he was born from born in 1872 and passed away in 1969. He was a British aristocrat and an administrator in colonial India. So, like, he, he was a high ranking guy okay right. like he had the funds he was probably educated so it makes you question why did he have this kit was right. he someone that was interested in it was it just kind of like a, a party attention grabber stating hey well while you're having dinner check out this guy and he right. opens the kit right. and he's like i am very cool yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely or was it something he kept by his bedside in one case the vampire come in, he's got the gun with a silver bullet, the holy water. And uh, then if he can shoot the vampire and wounded, he's got the stake and the mallet to finish it off, drive it through its heart. So, you know, we don't know unless we, we knew the guy could really get some insight oh. into, you know, his life, his thought process. We, we don't know, but we do know uh, that these were made and that they were believed in. And, uh, yeah, there was a real fear of vampires there back was a in real this fear time. Of vampires and uh, people used to put uh, those iron cages over the graves of people who were suspected of being vampires or werewolves or other weird <laughs> entities or you know transforming creatures to try and keep that body in the ground. And uh, and, you know, and that is consistent throughout all cultures. All that that's cultures, why that's why cultures. we nail coffins, right? That so the dead doesn't do not come back. Do exactly. they do not? walk exactly. amongst the living and yeah. so when we're looking at this kit right when we are aware that during the late 1800s even into the early 1900s i mean the, the fear of vampires was real so could yeah. this have been sold to him as like a, a fear campaign and like a superstition thing i mean that would be really smart to sell a bunch of kits to people that are just scared absolutely right? absolutely make a ton of money and uh, you know, it's, so that is a possibility, you know, we, we really don't know. But uh, I, I do know through my own research that there were people throughout history that were uh, frightened enough of vampires and had the belief in vampires that they would buy these kits as a, as a prophylactic against the vampires as a, as a safety measure. So there was a real belief in this. Yeah, and then look, look at the book Dracula that was published in 1897. I mean, this was just around the time, right? Just a few years, maybe two day, two decades after Lord Haley. But like the very first book that was published about uh, vampires was really was literally called The Vampire, and that was published in 1819. It's kind of became more prevalent in the Western kind of mentality or ideology of, of what are vampires what is this what is going on and that's kind of where that fear began to arise of oh my goodness this this entity is going to suck your blood and it's going to kill you and it's going to live on forever and ever right, right. and 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 to this day there's a bunch if not probably thousands of movies about vampires the yeah. most famous one being the um twilight yeah the twilight series yeah which exactly. my wife loves. <laughs> I've I've actually never seen it. Oh my god, you got to see it. It's great. I've got werewolves and vampires and werewolves fighting vampires, and uh, it's it's really great. It's it's really pretty cool. But I did watch the parody version of that movie, and now the name escapes me. Those yeah. in the live chat, please tell me what that uh, parody movie of the of Twilight is, because that one's really funny. That one's really really yeah. funny for those yeah. that have seen it. But jumping into our next article, when I came across this one, I'm like, I, I need to ask John this. I need to ask John as a paranormal investigator and as a psychic medium. Hopefully he can give me the answers to this one. And we are dealing with, can a heat wave increase paranormal activity levels? So before we get into the article, I do want to hear your input on that. Is, is it a yes or no? Or is it just gonna, sometimes? Yeah, I'm going to say yes. And I'll tell you why. Um, anything that alters our physiology uh, in such a way that it depresses it or shakes it up or 
makes us uncomfortable or, or alters our normal perception, that enables us then to be more perceptive and more receptive to the other side, the, the paranormal realm and psychic activity and paranormal activity. I'll give you a really good example of that. When I talk about anything that that changes your normal perception and changes your normal physiology, and of course, getting overheated does. And uh, we're aware that, you know, when a heat wave goes on and on, crime increases, uh, you know, people get just, ah, I can't stand it. They got to get out there. They're just going nuts from the heat. And uh, so that does change your perception, your physiology. And when that changes, you are more receptive to paranormal things, whether you want to be or not, or whether you believe in them or not. And uh, one example of things that changes your physiology uh, in much the same way as extreme heat is alcohol. Mm -hmm. And when I, uh, I remember I used to, there was this uh, very, very large psychic fair that I used to go to in Austin, Texas and, and do readings there uh, way back many, many decades ago. And uh, there was uh, the hotel that it was in had this, it was a huge psychic fair, very, very large psychic fair. And it was in that hotel and the hotel also had a restaurant and a little bar all self-contained in the hotel. So at the end of the day, from doing the readings, I'd go in the uh, in the the restaurant and eat, then go to the bar, have a few drinks, go up to my room, then come down the next day, do it all over again. So um, this, uh, I met this friend that I had met during the psychic fair over in the bar, and we were having drinks, and we started to get pretty well into our cups, and uh, the bartender came over and said, uh, "You know, well, what are you guys doing?" I said, "Oh, we're we're psychics here at the psychic fair," and he goes, "Well, well, that's cool. I don't know if I believe it or not, but that's cool." So we looked at each other and we were like, let's make a believer out of this guy. It's like, okay. So we're normally in presenting a reading or telling people things that you see, you would be a little bit discreet and, you know, a little bit polite. We were well enough into our cups that we were just like, okay, here's this, here's that. Here's <laughs> and this guy was like, oh my God. And it just, it totally lowers your inhibitions and enables you to connect better and enables you to express things better. And uh, the result of that was that the uh, the guy said we got we got through telling him everything we wanted to tell him. We just kind of went back and forth on the guy for a long time, and uh, we got done. We said, "Okay, now were we accurate or not?" And he looked at us and he said, "You know, I've never really, really believed in anything like this." But he said, "My God, you guys have blown my hair back." He said, "Everything you've said, as far as all the insights you've given me about my life and and people and things that I people I know and everything." We're a hundred percent. And he said, the only thing that I can't give you is these two items. And I have to go make a phone call. And he went and made a phone call. And he came back and he said, you were right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So there are a lot of things, weather will alter your perceptions and that can make you more receptive uh, to what's going on out there. Maybe it doesn't actually change uh, the physicality of the paranormal. Maybe that's always there but it changes our perceptivity of it and our receptivity to it. So well, maybe I have, yeah, I mean, I've, I've come across this in my research that like high heat can create a lot of stress and anxiety, which manifests in bad moods, bad mm -hmm. tempers and right. an increase in crime rates. And as you like, just as you said, so right. do peace, people basically feel paranormal entities or energies in those situations? I mean, for example, one of the hottest cities in the United States is Phoenix, Arizona, which, right. by the way, is the city with the highest paranormal events in Arizona. So the mm -hmm. the number one city of paranormal activity reports. So what what do you think about that? I think that's a, a, a valid hypothesis. And uh, I think we should do a lot more research on that. I know that uh, during thunderstorms, for example, that's a good time to go ghost hunting, a good time to have paranormal activity, a good time for manifestations, uh, extreme cold, is the same way, not just extreme heat, but extreme cold will do the same thing. Uh, very windy, very stormy conditions uh, are, are sometimes good for, you know, an, an increased awareness of such phenomena. Uh, so it's anything that kind of disturbs the status quo. And if you think about it, if you're ghost hunting or having a, a mediumistic circle or, or anything like that, you're creating a mini environment where you're disturbing the status quo.
because you're entering an altered state of consciousness through prayer, chanting, meditation, invoking the spirits, whatever it is you're doing. So you're creating kind of a mini environment when you do that, that disrupts the normal flow of things. So anything that disrupts the normal flow of things can lead to that increased awareness, can lead to increased activity. So is it maybe because of, you know, there, there are such strong kinetic charges with wind and storms and like static charges in the air that are affecting paranormal activity? I think that's part of it. Yeah. I think that, I think that the weather literally uh, can play a part of it physically and that it can bring about the conditions necessary for, for these things to occur. And as you point out in places where there's extremes of weather, you tend to have a lot of paranormal activity. And it's like there's maybe barriers there, atmospheric barriers that that breaks down and facilitates uh, paranormal activity to be, you know, more easily perceived or more easily connected with. And I know that um, for me, the perception of connecting with the paranormal, it's, it's always better if things are a little disturbed. It's always better if things are a little out of kilter. Can and, you go into detail on that? What what do you mean? Well, it's um, like if you go into a, a, let's say, a haunted location, you're doing a, a paranormal investigation. Uh, it's better if things are a little off, if there's a full moon or if it's a little windy or if it's a little stormy or something like that. Uh, I think that helps us to get in the right frame of mind to make that connection. Whereas if we're going in, we're laughing and we're silly and we're this, that, and the other, or we're calm, we're peaceful, we're relaxed. We're not that attentive. We're not that expectant. And it's not to say that our expectation creates things. It just enables us to connect with the things that are there. And um, so anything that's, that's kind of out of kilter, I remember, and you don't have to believe for that to work. Uh, my wife and I took a vacation. We went to Salem. And there was a, um, a ghost walk there that we went on to Salem. I write about this in my second book. It, it was really awesome that we were having this ghost tour at night there. And it went by the cemetery and the cemetery had a, uh, an open iron fence. that was only about three or four feet tall. And you could see through the fence, see out into the cemetery. And so this was at nighttime. And as the crowd gathered and the tour guide was talking to us, about a third of the people were laughing and scoffing and just totally skeptical. About a third of the people were believers. About a third of the people didn't care one way or the other. They were just there for the tour. And um, that night it was fairly hot. And I can't, I don't remember if there was a full moon or not, or if it was a new moon or whatever it was, but there was enough moonlight that you could see out into the cemetery for a little ways. And so that setting was just right. That energy was just right. And as we walked down the street and again, it was hot. Uh, hot enough to almost be sweating. And as we walked down the street, we hit this cold spot, this chilly spot on the sidewalk. And it extended all the way down the rest of the sidewalk. And you could hear the people, even the non-believers were going, did you feel that? It just got ice cold. What in the world's happening? It's freezing. It's chilly. What in the world's going on? And then about that time, people begin to see lights floating out in the cemetery and you could see far enough into the cemetery by the moonlight that you could tell there was no one out there wandering around with a flashlight because the lights were fairly close and they were floating up in the air around the tombstones and things and everybody saw that and there were voices that we heard everybody heard out in the cemetery uh, so again there was that environment you had that moonlight you had that the cemetery you had the, uh, you know, all the conditions in place uh, for, a, for a kind of an unsettling experience and enough that it kind of put people on edge a little bit, just like the heat does, that it, it kind of opened up their awareness more, you know, whereas somebody might have just walked down the cemetery uh, by the sidewalk and never looked into the cemetery, never given it a second thought by the conditions being there that way and by the, the moonlight the chill coming on, everything like that, it created that environment, just like the heat does. And it kind of put everybody in this receptive mode, this aware mode. And I think extreme heat, extreme weather, it does that. It makes you more sensitive of your surroundings and it, of your surroundings. And you may be irritated, uh, you may be uncomfortable, but that's a sensory heightening. That's a sensory awareness that comes on. 
because you're aware I'm hot. I'm uncomfortable. It's not normal out there. This is different. You know, I feel different. My skin feels different. My insides feel different. I look at things and it looks different. That's the way extreme heat affects you. I know growing up in West Texas where actual temperature sometimes is 110, 112. And believe me, you view things differently when it's that hot. You're more aware of things when it's that hot. You're aware of the, the feeling of the sweat on your arms and the hair on your arms and where the sweat's going and hanging and trickling and everything else. And you're aware of, of all the heat, of what the heat's doing out there, the way the trees look and the way the leaves droop and, and everything. So it does make this heightened sense of awareness. That is, I mean, I, it's not something that I realized until I began doing research on like heat and how it affected me. And I'm thinking now that you mention it, I get really irritated when it's super hot and I get yeah. like really sad when it's really, really cold. I just like, right. just like right. but in, in this article, they, they do look into that, especially in um, Great Britain. And you had one paranormal investigation group called the Plymouth Paranormal Team. Right. And the one of them was being Gary Parsons. And he had mentioned that with these certain heat waves that happen, that they get an increased amount of phone calls specifically between June and July when it comes to paranormal activity. Yeah. And when when I've spoken to other paranormal investigators, um, temperature for the most part hasn't really it, it's it's not greatly mentioned mm -hmm. you know it, it's more about the equipment that you use it's more about right. the knowledge that you have but something that i've seems that from my limited perspective that kind of the weather's brushed to the side like yeah, it's not that important but it mm -hmm. seems here based on this article that heat plays a a, a key role when yeah. it comes to paranormal activity and then it also makes me question right so we know that temperatures really affect our emotions our anxiety crime rates that i had mentioned a little bit earlier right is it are these entities attached to the energy that's being released, that irritation, that that sense of just like <laughs> upsetness, <laughs> that type of mood? Or is it really dealing with the uh, electromagnetic waves that are being produced by the sun? That's that's where my question lies. And John, I really want to hear your input on that. I think it's a combination of all of that. And uh, again, I think that, you know, just like where we're sitting right now and where everybody's sitting, watching, listening to this podcast, there's radio waves going through the air from multiple sources that we're not aware of. But if we get the right conditions, that is, we plug in a radio, turn the dial to the right setting. Oh, there's country music. We turn the dial. Oh, there's jazz. We turn the dial. Oh, there's, you know, whatever. But that's going through the air constantly. It's always there. We're just not aware of it until the conditions are right. And so these energies, these intelligences, these manifestations are always around us. But then when the heat comes on and we're disrupted and our attention is, you know, kind of defocused a little bit or maybe intensified a little bit, then we can become aware of that. We kind of tune in. We're kind of a receiver that we've hit the right dial all of a sudden. And we're, we're aware of that. So it's always going on, but I think there's things that facilitate it. Mm. Well, thank you for, for going into detail on that, because it is a question, a burning question. Keyword burning. is burning. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really happy that you addressed it. Now, <laughs> jumping into the next article, this one is going to be our just very strange video, strange picture of the week. Yeah. I do want to make this more um happening every single week just to pick up one just really strange photo or video and this one is <laughs> bizarre and we're going to get into that but i want to play the video first there is no audio so for those watching this on youtube keep your eyes peeled if you're listening to this on a podcast jump over to youtube so that you can watch this video all right here we go so we got this weird looking pale type entity that's just awkwardly walking. And this was captured by a security camera in Kentucky. And if you look at it, like its legs look kind of weird. It's very hunched back or hunched forward, excuse mm -hmm. me, like as if it's looking around of attempting to understand 
what's going on and trying to be very stealthy, very oh, quiet. Oh. And that is the video. And we can play it again a little bit later. But um, and and it's all one color as well as you noticed. It's just it's just white. There yeah. there isn't any real contrast. There's no contour. There's no like articles of clothing that can be seen, like a t-shirt and pants or like a right, dress or right. whatever. There's no real detail. Now we can state, oh well, the video footage is is just crappy. Like it's just not good quality. <laughs> but we can still kind of infer at least a little bit of the figure like the yeah. shapes and if it is wearing articles of clothing which based on that video it didn't really seem to be the case unless it's like one of those like tight one one suits you know i don't know what those are called but those ones that Onesies, they yeah. wear as mannequins or overalls or yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, absolutely. Uh, Curious George says, okay, how is this a security camera when it's handheld? It seems that, and that's a really great question, it seems that it's a recording of a security camera, if that makes sense, maybe. But that's what I had read in this article that was published by Bro Bible, that it was caught on a security camera in Moorhead, Kentucky. Now, also, there are certain security cameras that can be pivoted, moved, zoomed in, zoomed out. And there are certain security cameras that are monitored live. And so the people that are watching them can zoom in and out and, and move the camera around. So that's a possibility. It, it could be. And there's been a lot. Well, see, this when this video came out, there was a lot of speculation of like, what the heck is going on? Now, the person that had recorded this stated that it almost looked like this entity's kneecaps were backward. And mm -hmm. it kind of reminded them of Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. And I'm right, like, right. hmm, that's mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> but there have been some other speculations that it's probably not a cryptid. It could have been someone in a full body suit, could have been a drug addict or a mentally ill person. But that doesn't really fully explain how this entity in this video is just completely one shade of white. Right, right. I found that yeah, very a, creepy. A security camera will at least pick up like dark pants and a white t-shirt or, you know, skin tone as opposed to, um, you know, clothing. And um, so it's, uh, yeah, that, that is the, the unanswered question there is how do you make this, you know, all white? Uh, and how do you get the, the head portion to match the rest of the body, the arms and the legs and all that? It would have to be a heck of a one piece suit if you did that, you know? So who knows? Who knows? And Pixie, you are totally right. That's definitely what I was trying to say, um, because that that seems to be correct. Now, for those that watched this video, what are your thoughts? Do you think it's something really weird? Do you think it's just a, a hoax of some kind? Or what? I mean, I want to hear your thoughts in the live chat. And John, if let's say you were to have captured this on your security camera, what right. would be going through your mind? Wow. Well, you know, I would have to looking at this as it is. If I had captured that, I wouldn't have a knee jerk response to it. I wouldn't say, oh, well, this is just some druggie walking through the yard or or whatever. I would really have to look at this thing, examine it very closely, uh, enlarge it as much as I could. I would take it to someone that had the skills, the technical ability and the equipment uh, to really put this through the grinder and analyze it and see what's going on. Uh, yeah, you can look at it and say, well, it kind of looks like some old junkie hobbling around or this, that and the other. But like you point out, Christina, where's the clothes? Where's the pants, the shirt, whatever? Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's interesting enough that I think it deserves further attention. It doesn't look like uh, any normal thing that you normally see through a security camera. Could it be prank? Yes. Could it be hoaxed? Yes. But the argument that I always tell people that I remind people of is just because something that can be hoaxed doesn't mean the real doesn't exist. So we have to take that into account. We have to make allowances for that. We can't just automatically dismiss anything out of hand. Uh, we don't want to just automatically accept it either, but we can't just dismiss it out of hand either. 
That is completely correct. Everything is on the table. And then we, we can't simply discard some things, keep others, because then we are not making the mural of truth. We're, we're true. making a mural of what we perceive to be true, but exactly. we need all exactly. of those details. And we need later, all of those details. And we have to be willing to follow the truth no matter where it leads us. Now, if after extensive reliable analysis, it's some drunk stumbling around at night, fantastic. We'll accept that truth. If after extensive analysis, it can't be explained, then we have to be willing to accept that truth as well. We can't have it both ways. It's got to be, if you're going to go for the truth, you have to go where the truth leads you. And, and at the same time, you can't kind of mentally manifest what you think the truth will be because then you'll exactly. always be disappointed as well. Exactly. So you have to remain open-minded and not yeah. really with the full conclusion on what you think is going on. Because if you do, then you yeah. won't be open to the new details well, that are going to shift your paradigm. There's so many skeptics that their minds made up when they go in and their concept of examining anything in the paranormal is that this is automatically going to be this thing. This is automatically going to be that thing and it's all explainable and so on and so forth. So they go in with their minds made up and that's not what a serious investigator does. A serious investigator goes in and says, okay, show me. And then once they're shown, let's figure out what this is. And if it's uh, a bird flying through the air that was uh, camera kind of goofed it up when they caught it, okay, we'll accept that. But if it's a UFO flying through the air, then we have to accept that. So you have exactly. to do whatever. Exactly. But yeah, looking at this again, there doesn't seem to be any delineation of clothes, shirts, shoes, pants. Uh, the head looks a little elongated and strange. Again, yeah, could be some type of camera artifact, could be a hoax, could be something. But whatever it is, I think it's interesting enough to investigate with an open mind. And uh, if it turns out to be some guy saying, hey, let's play a prank on everybody and put this on the internet, fine. But if it turns out to be something that's inexplicable, then we need to be able to accept that as well. And I would like to mention that I will be placing the links in the information window below once this show is over so that if you want to watch this video in particular, or all the other articles that we cover, you definitely can once we are done. Because if you want to look at that video frame by frame, do it because it is yeah. very weird more power to you yeah. and when we're looking at different types of videos and trying to be able to decipher what is real and what is a hoax well mm -hmm. there is a new company coming out called enigma labs registered in delaware and they want to build a repository to catalog uh, score and crowdsource ufo incidents and expose hoaxes Right. This is a big deal. It this is, is going to be made public. And if you take a look at their logo, it looks like the gimbal. Yeah. Or the TikTok, you know, <laughs> what say. But this this was this is really, really big news, and it was published by the Bloomberg website. So pretty much the Enigma Lab founder. Alex Smith, who has a background in data science and aerospace, says the Internet is full of nonsense and it's very hard to get good information. Yeah. There was really no destination for credible information, data and sharing of expertise and insights. So Enigma has launched a private beta test of the project with the plan to offer a public iPhone application in the fall. So you'll be able to download this onto your cell phone. So once Enigma makes its application public, submitters will have a drop down, will have drop down menus to select to select characteristics such as location and shape of the object. Eventually, submitters could use voice note dials and secure drops as well. So currently, the um, the application will be free, but Enigma will eventually charge fees for question and answer sessions and for scientists to use derivative projects of the data. So this is incredibly exciting. I am I am ready for this. I'm ready to download it like right now. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good idea. 
Uh, one thing I would tell people to do though, uh, I'm a professional photographer and I have, I have sold my photos worldwide. And when you take a photo with a cell phone, even a really good cell phone and you blow that photo up, it's crap. It, mm -hmm. It's horrific. So I would tell people two things. If you're serious about searching the skies and about uh, photographing UFOs, UAPs, get a good 35 millimeter SLR. Get you a good 35 millimeter camera, a dedicated camera with a good zoom lens and learn how to use it. And then you're going to get these absolutely wonderful, crisp, fantastic, fantastic pictures that you can blow up in size or that you can zoom in on and examine without losing picture quality. And the second thing is, for God's sakes, please, please get a good quality tripod, <laughs> mount that camera on the tripod and learn how to use it, learn how to pan and move with a tripod because if you're in your twenties and you've got super steady hands and you're in good health and you're using a fast shutter speed, you might get a fairly crisp picture as you age that if, if, even if you hold your hands up and you think my hands don't shake, yes, they do. When they're holding a camera and that camera will reveal it. If you want a tack sharp picture that when people look at it, doesn't look like that. Get a tripod, mount your camera, learn how to use it, aim it up there. When you see the object, just tighten that tripod down to where everything's still and start shooting or learn to just barely loosen it and track the tripod, you know, move the tripod along with the object and get every, most of the things that you see that were super, super interesting. They're, you know, here's the object and it's, it's moving around like this because some guy can't hold his camera still or his cell phone still. And it's like, you know, and you just get the thing centered in the frame and still and focus on it. So learn to do that. And that's what we really need is people out there with good 35 millimeter zoom lenses, tripods, and then getting some really solid photographs of these things that people are seeing. And it's a great idea to have this clearing house and to be able to get rid of some of the, the chaff out there and get, you know, get to the wheat. There you go. And Avi Loeb also made a similar statement when he was briefed on the Enigma Labs, practically stating, even if you have a million cell phone images, mm -hmm. they will always be blurry because the cameras are just not great. The cameras cannot great. resolve an object yeah. at a distance of a mile. And that's exactly. why we need telescopes. So cell phone images just can't produce conclusive or scientific data. But yeah. he did state that he is looking forward to working alongside Enigma Labs and sharing each other's data. So it goes to show that this, this, the same thought that you're having, John, of like, yeah, everyone has a cell phone, but we, they just take the worst pictures of the uh, sky. Yeah. <laughs> that that maybe we either need to invest in decent cameras a good tripod or yeah. even telescopes as well because the information is out there we're able to collect that data Absolutely. we just need the equipment to yeah. collect the proper data or at least the data that we want which is good quality stuff practically yeah. and i think people just haven't understood that if you take a photograph if you take a portrait of someone uh sitting in your living room and you look at it on a, that tiny little screen on your phone, it looks great. Now, upload that to your computer and blow it up to screen size and see how crappy it looks and how out of focus it is and how pixelated it can become. So people need to understand that, yeah, boy, this looks great on my two inch by two inch screen. But when you blow it up on your computer or larger, or make a print out of it, it looks God awful. So if you're serious about capturing this, serious about research, get a dedicated 35 millimeter camera, get you a zoom lens, learn how to use it, learn how to do all the adjustments in the settings, get a tripod so that the thing is stable so that people aren't going, my God, you've got just billions of pixels in here and it's great. And it would have been sharp, except you were moving the camera all around. You were jiggling it with your hands, you know, and you're going to do that. Trust me, you are going to do that. If you'll read any professional photography um, lessons, guidelines, teachings, whatever, 
the first thing they tell you, stick that camera on a tripod because you're going to shake and the picture is going to be blurry. It may not look like it is on the screen on the camera and it may not look like it is in 700 by 1,000 pixels on the computer, but blow it up larger and you'll see that there's pieces of it that are blurred or out of focus. So let's get that good, good evidence where people have to say, well, yep, yeah, there it is. John, do you know what noodling is? Noodling. Well, there's several different noodling. You can noodle on a guitar. Uh, you can noodle for catfish in the river. Uh, <laughs> and that's the one that we are going to talk about. That this, this word was very new to me. Noodling is when yeah. you're catching fish with your hands. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. why shouldn't it should just be called catching fish with your hands, not noodling. <laughs> like, I don't know why they call it noodling, but I have seen people, and especially they do this for catfish. And, uh, you know, catfish, large catfish, you know, they got, they've got teeth, they've got, you know, ridged plates, everything. They can bite down on you really well. And uh, I've seen people go into the murky rivers, muddy rivers, and reach up into these holes in the banks looking for the catfish and See, grabbing that, them. That, that does not grab sound grab onto them and they'll yank them out. And sometimes they get snakes, water moccasins up in there. And they'll yank them out and throw them over their shoulders and keep fishing around for any fish that might be up in there. I'm like, you are out of your mind. You are crazy. <laughs> See, that that sounds awful. When I saw the word noodling, I'm like, oh, yeah. ramen. I mean, noodling is with ramen noodles. I do that every single day. I <laughs> love this. And then I read it and I'm just like, no, thank you. I think I'm going to pass not, on that. That sounds really like, difficult. There's, there's no way that I would ever do that. And I've been, I've been lipped, you know, I've been bitten by a very small catfish when I was trying to lip it and take it out of the water when I hooked it when I was fishing. And man, they can put a bite on you. And the bigger ones, they can really do you some damage. They can really put some hurt on you. And I see these guys getting there and do this crazy stuff. And it's like, no, thank you. Not for me. So the reason to why I brought this up for those that are listening, like, why is she bringing up noodling? Well, turns out an Oklahoma man allegedly confessed to killing a fesh, uh, fellow noodler out of fear that he'd be left alone in the wilderness to be eaten <laughs> by Bigfoot. <laughs> Okay, so we there there's a lot to get into with this one because wow, that's yeah. a lot going on right this, there. This is some crazy stuff here. I mean, this this is this is strange news. I mean, very very strange. very strange. And that's what this show is all about because I, I I almost don't have words when I was coming across this article. I'm like, what? Anyways, <laughs> this is the man Larry who murdered his fellow noodler, Jimmy Knighton. So Larry Sanders, and this is an, this is in an affidavit. It says Larry Sanders claimed that while at the river, he discovered his friend Jimmy Knighton intended to feed him to Sasquatch slash Bigfoot. Larry indicated Jimmy attempted to get away from him so that the Sasquatch could eat Larry. Larry would not let Jimmy get away. So Larry punched Jimmy and struck Jimmy with a stick. Larry and Jimmy fought for an extended amount of time on the ground. And then Larry confirmed he did kill his fellow noodler by choking him to death near the river. And that's all in the affidavit. But he later... Larry Sanders later draws a map and shared details of where investigators could find Jimmy's body, which was found on Sunday. And it's believed to be Jimmy and it gets weirder, but I, I, I hear, I hear you kind of you laughing in the background and, and I don't, I don't blame you. This is, this is very oh, weird. This, uh, this is the poster child for just say no, you know, number one. And I mean, what a story, you know, I'm going to, I've premeditated this murder. I'm going to kill this guy. How can I get away with this? Ah, oh, I know he was going to feed me to Bigfoot and I had to save my own life. I had to kill him so Bigfoot wouldn't eat me. Oh, jeez. <laughs> that I guy mean... is a genius. He should be writing novels. <laughs> well, he can do that in prison. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's there what you he's going to be writing oh, them. <laughs> 
<laughs> just, you know, I, I have seen people come up with excuses for crimes, but man, this takes the cake. This is some, this, this is some ingenious thinking right here. Well, well we're going to continue with this, but DJ Knight says, a Bigfoot is incident of these crimes. Innocent of these crimes, yes. I to agree with you on that one. <laughs> so Sanders' daughter told the deputy that her dad did confess to the murder of Jimmy, and she claimed uh, Larry later returned to hit to the residence frantic and talking about Bigfoot. Larry <laughs> claimed Jimmy was trying to feed Larry to Bigfoot, so Larry had to kill Jimmy. And I just I do want to mention that Larry oh, and Jimmy, my. these are just like very <laughs> simple <laughs> names. So Larry had mentioned that uh, that he he was trying to strangle Jimmy and possibly <laughs> firing two shots from a pistol and again that is in the affidavit but what's mm. interesting uh, about this is that sheriff deputy said sanders appeared to be under the influence of illegal drugs on saturday however while he appeared to be under the influence of illegal drugs there is no information on if he was or wasn't the craziest thing about this is that jimmy and larry's kids were dating each other I don't know if they're still dating now because this is definitely a strain on any kind of relationship. But I, I found that, um, that, that extra detail rather important. Isn't it strange? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my, what a story. Yes, it, (laughs) it is unbelievable. And again, I have to agree with DJ Knight that uh, Uh, big, Bigfoot is innocent here. He is totally innocent of this story. Bigfoot's got to be innocent. I don't, I don't think Bigfoot was going to eat anybody. I don't think we've had a record of Bigfoot eating anyone, have we? Not to my knowledge, to my but knowledge. then again, then again, you know, I haven't done extensive Bigfoot research. Um, I'm, I'm getting there. I am kind of edging my way over there because it is, he is a rather fascinating cryptid, plural, yeah, not just yeah. one, but multiple. But oh, I, I do yeah. want to um, mention that again, when I came across this, I'm thinking this could not be more, more strange. This, this could you, not yeah. be better for today's show. Exactly right. This is one of the most bizarre things. I had to kill this guy because he was going to feed me to Bigfoot. I mean, it don't get better than that. It don't get stranger than that. That's that's pretty bizarre. No, no, it does not. <laughs> so let's let's get into our next article, and that's dealing with the House votes to make it easier to report UFOs. Uh, also, yeah. this is a big deal. Yeah. This is a very big deal. Mm-hmm. So, John, tell us about it. Why... For those that are not familiar with this topic, the UFO topic, why is this important? Well, you know, for forever, uh, people that have reported UFOs have been held in ridicule. Uh, you could lose your job. Pilots would lose their wings. They couldn't fly anymore if they reported UFOs. Uh, military people were discouraged from reporting UFOs. Uh, so just recently, uh, has the government and the, the report that they gave us, the little nine-page report that came out, Uh, Did they say that, hey, we have to create an environment where people can report this without censure and without being made fun of and that it can be taken seriously and without repercussions to their, you know, their livelihood, to their, their jobs, their careers, whatever. So it's important that we be able to do this, that we have this, uh, I think, maybe a central gathering of, uh, of information for people where everybody can come and make their reports known in one central location. Uh, the problem is, is this a, a token gesture? Are they actually going to do anything with it? Uh, that's, that's where you come up against the, uh, against the grain of things here because the government is so famous for, I always say when I'm discussing the government and committees, the government will form a committee to think about forming a committee, to study a committee, to do something about this. And it usually goes nowhere or else it gets buried in so much red tape that it's ridiculous. So, um, you know, it's, it's, if they would actually do something and really move toward legitimate disclosure, if they would actually take these reports seriously and do something with them uh, in an official capacity, that would be great. But I, I'm not crossing my fingers. I, I have my doubts. Well, there are a few 
congressmen that are, are really pushing forward for this, uh, yeah. specifically Gallagher. And he had stated to Politico that our primary interest is to ensure that our military and intelligence community are armed with the best possible information, capital, and scientific resources to defeat yeah. our enemies and maintain military and technological superiority. But superiority but right. he, what what's interesting about this is that they really want to make people that are having ufo sightings public doesn't matter if you are military doesn't matter what in, um you know and any of this type of stuff they want to say look we, we want to record absolutely everything because this is important and what they want to do is to fact gather and further prove or disprove the origin and threat nature of whatever seems to be flying in our skies. Right. So while people might disagree with this whole threat narrative, it seems that regardless of that, the government is taking that stance. So John, I do want to ask you, what are your thoughts on the threat narrative? Is it something that is understandable or do you think it's just downright silly? I think the threat narrative is real. Um, I have tried to investigate, delve into as many UFO stories as I could from credible, reliable sources. And those are ones that um, reputable ufologists have just have discovered, have verified throughout the years. Uh, I think in a nutshell, it comes down to uh, Rob Shelsky, who's a MUFON field investigator. I, I listened to him on a podcast and he said, you know, where is the story where you're lost in the woods at night, you're afraid you may not make it, and this UFO comes over, shines down a beam of light, and you follow the beam of light and it leads you out of the woods to safety. Where is that story? We don't have it. But we have forced abductions. We have forced experiments. We have tortures. We have missing time. We have radiation burns and sicknesses. We have other sicknesses. We have implanted tracking devices. We have cattle mutilations. We have all these things that are done against our will. So there does seem to be a threat narrative there. Uh, at, the, at the very least, uh, they're impartial. At the worst, it's hostile. And there have been numerous reports of near misses with UFOs with not only fighter aircraft, but with civilian aircraft as well. And those have been documented. I have become aware of a couple of um, credible stories, documented stories, where UFOs actually collided with aircraft and and took them down, that they were damaged and, and took them down and crashed. And there's reliable stories there. There is a very, very, very little known, but very credible story. Uh, and I can't think of the country right off the top of my head because, again, this is not my field of specialty. I don't pursue it that diligently, but uh, you can research and find it. It's out there. And uh, in this country, these UFOs would appear at night and fire on the civilians. They would fire. Yeah, that was Brazil. Calaris, yeah, Brazil. Brazil. And they would fire on these these civilians. So uh, the, the, cred, uh, the, the uh, threat hypothesis seems to be pretty credible at this stage of the game. And again, the problem is we don't know what we're dealing with because the government won't tell us. They haven't given us anything on which to hang our hats. And I keep going back to the idea that somebody somewhere in the government has to know. I mean, these things have been visiting the planet for forever. And we've been seeing them, encountering them, and our military has been dealing with them and other worldwide militaries have been dealing with them for decades and decades and decades, somebody's got to have an inkling of what's going on. And the main thing that we need to come to is, hey, let's not create a committee to have people come report this. Let's create a committee to make our government say, what in the world's going on? Tell us what you really know up to this point. When we get to there, that's when I'm going to be happy. I'll be jumping up and down. Well, Gallagher did add in a statement to Politico that I believe it's possible that folks may be precluded from being fully transparent with Congress due to their bound by non-disclosure agreements, NDAs. If that's true, I want to make it sure that there's no technical reason preventing them from speaking to us. And right. 
Right. The, what he said is key because that is something that a lot of people fear is that they're going to go ahead and, and break their NDA. And, and there yeah. are consequences for that. There so he is stating there, there are intense consequences. Yeah. And as Ms. Elder, uh, Mr. Elizondo says, he doesn't look good in orange, right? Yeah. We, we, we don't yeah. want to see him in orange. <laughs> well, and you know, the other thing, Christina, is that I had a, a friend of mine who's now on the other side and he was a very, very dear friend, very close friend. He was a major in the Air Force. He had been a fighter pilot. He had done work for the NSA. Uh, a lot of uh, top secret classified things. He had top secret clearances. And he would go right up to the verge of telling me certain things and stop. And what people have to understand is that people that are in the military and hold those clearances, for the most part, they take that oath so powerfully, so they hold it so close to their heart. They take it so sincerely that they're not going to break that. They're going to, they look at themselves as warriors and defenders of this country, of our freedoms, defenders of the people, protectors of the people. And they know the secrets that they've been entrusted with, and they're not going to break that that vow, that, that vow of secrecy. They're not going to break those NDAs. And they hold that very near and dear to their hearts. And there were things that he could have told me that he didn't, that he took to his grave. And he did tell me some things that were unclassified or maybe semi-classified, but nothing that would risk national security, uh, nothing that would break his oath. So I, I understand that. I get that. But where we're at now, in the staying time that we're in now, we got to have some people that are willing to come forward. And, and I'm not saying they don't need to betray their oath. They don't need to betray national secrecy. They don't need to endanger the U.S. But man, we got to have some answers. And there's people out there with answers. And look, at this stage of the game, there's got to be somebody that has balls big enough, if you'll pardon the expression, to just come out and say, people, here's something I know for a fact that you can hang your hat on. And here's the proof. Here's the evidence. Now let's push for more. And why do I think that way? Why do I believe that way? Well, for the simple reason that where are these crafts coming from? Who are they piloted by? What are their intentions? And we don't seem to be able to make any reasonable connection, helpful connection, healing connection with these intelligences. And it's obvious that everybody on the planet knows they're here. Every government has researched them. Uh, millions of people have seen them. And for our governments to all keep saying repeatedly, well, we just don't know what's going on. I can't buy it. And look, we need to know what's going on. The earth is in trouble. The earth has always been in trouble. You read history and people in the earth have always been in trouble. But I mean, now we have the technology to do things that we didn't before. And we're all connected instantaneously. I can send a text to a friend of mine in Ukraine and find out how the war is going and, and all that type of thing instantaneously. So we're all instantaneously connected. We have weaponry and weapons of mass destruction that can destroy the world many times over. We have crazy, wild um, technological inventions and in science and military and everything that affect our lives on this planet. And we have problems. We have plagues now we have all these diseases coming out and all these things happening here in florida we got monkeypox on the rise for god's sake and we need some answers we need some things that will help us out and these things flying around the skies abducting people affecting millions of people affecting technology turning nuclear missiles on and off we need to know what's going on and i have maintained all the way through that we as a public are brave enough, smart enough, enduring enough to handle the truth. If the government tells us, okay, look, here it is. Uh, these are visitors from da, 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 and here's their intention, and here's what we've been doing and why. The people that are in church are still going to be in church. They're just going to start praying for the aliens now. And <laughs> the people that have developed certain technologies and inventions and things, they're going to keep on doing that. Uh, as far as the propulsion systems and things of these crafts, oh, it'll destroy our, our economy, our oil will cease to be, and, and the whole system, though. No, it won't, because it'll take a long time to adapt to that technology, whatever it is, if 
they revealed it to us if we could have it, if we could use it, if we were given that. So, you know, life pretty much, and I think everybody else, most, most people's reaction, would there be a panic in the streets? No, I think most people would be like, well, it's about time. Now, what are we going to do about it? You know, that's kind of how we're built. That's kind of how we've survived all these years. We're a pretty bunch of tough people. We go up against tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and famines and diseases, and we keep on trucking. So I don't think the revelation of what's going on from outer space uh, is, is going to bring everything to a halt. No, but what Congress is doing and in the shows that we do like this uh, is is helping fill in those gaps for people that do have questions. And right. look at MUFON, that they just had their MUFON symposium in Denver last weekend, and yep. they had some pretty high-profile people there. And I was, I was pretty shocked. We had Andre Carson, Representative Andre Carson, and we also had Representative Tim Burchett that went ahead and gave a small speech while they were there you, uh, through Zoom. Uh, Carson did do a pre-recorded video for MUFON, but here's the thing. The fact that we are having people that are a part of Congress joining this is just... It, this is a big deal because, look, 10 years, let, let's just go back 10 years ago. It would yeah. be a joke. Congress would not touch it. No politician would be like, oh, yeah, let me be a guest speaker for this. Exactly. They, they Nobody would have touched not, it. Yeah. Mm -mm. But just recently, we are yeah. having two very high profile people that are involved in politics that are yeah. like, yeah, you know what? I'll go ahead and, and do a, a, a few minute speech. I'll, I'll talk about the importance of this. Exactly. And that is saying something. Now, with uh, with Burchette, isn't he the uh, congressman from Tennessee? He is the, yes, congressman yeah. from he was, Tennessee. He was on. Uh, he was on uh, the uh, phone home uh, that uh, that uh, uh, oh, our friend that does the podcast, Luis Jimenez, the, the big yeah, thank you. He, he was on the big phone home with him, and he did say, uh, Burchett did say that uh, to uh, to paraphrase him, but very very close closely, basically what he said is right now we need to kick ass and take names. And that's, and what he said. Names. that's what he said. And he said, and, look, he said, we have to press for disclosure uh, really, really hard right now and not take excuses from the government. We have to really put people's feet to the fire and, uh, and, and really get something done now that we have this opportunity. So he's one of the people that uh, in Congress, having heard this and having had access to the full report, uh, is coming out and saying, hey, you know, you, you got to press things. And one of the things he said in the big phone home during his interview there was very, very telling because he said uh, he said there was a liquor lobbyist when he was coming up through the ranks in politics. And he said this guy was the stereotypical guy. And you can go and, and listen to this online. It's there. And he said the guy was the stereotypical lobbyist. He had a glass of bourbon in one hand, big cigar in the other. And he told him, he said, listen, he said, I control all this. And he said, congressmen are going to come and go, and I'm going to be here forever. And he said, you know what? I went up through the ranks, and I became a congressman, and that guy's still there, and he's still calling the shots. And he says, so you have to understand the political machine that you're trying to get through to get through to the truth. And he said in this interview, he said, guys like me, if I come out and start waking too many waves, I'm going to commit suicide by two shots to the back of my head. He said that in this interview. So that's the machinery that we're up against. And what he said, and by way of explanation of that, he said, look, two guys in an alley over a $20 drug deal going wrong will kill each other. Now you start mm -hmm. messing with people where millions or billions of dollars are involved. <laughs> you know, you're gone, you're history, you're erased. And so this is a lot of the thing that we have to be aware of that we're dealing with too, is money and power, uh, the, the systems that are in place, the people that are in place and breaking through that. And, you know, the example of that is when the average citizen comes up against science or Congress and the military and says, Hey, what about this? Here's your, here's your answer. And it's a redacted page that's solid black and there's your information that go away. And so we, that's what we're battling against. And that's what he's saying we have to break through. 
And he said in this in this interview on the big phone home, he said, you know, put the pressure on and don't relent. Exactly. And it's men like him that are pushing really hard in Congress. Yeah. Now, these congressmen have been briefed by Mr. Luis Elizondo several times and Christopher Mellon in closed door meetings. So what, whatever they heard, pushing them to dig deeper into confidential records. And, you know, here they are being very, very vocal. Burchette also said in a news interview is that he wished he could speak publicly about what he knows. He knows. Yeah. You know, if, if he could, I'm sure it would change everything. Yeah. yeah, he has a secrecy agreement. And you have to respect that. But again, going back to what I said earlier, at some point, somebody needs to break ranks in a safe way if they can and, and come out. And, you know, and, and look, the um, I, I write about this in one of my books, and I've said this on several podcasts. I encountered a woman at the Roswell UFO Museum who uh, told me that when she was a child, her and her brother saw the craft come over and crash. And I was so gobsmacked, I couldn't see straight. And I was like, <laughs> why don't people like you come forward and give this testimony and talk to people about this? And she said, well, let me tell you why. She said, when that happened, she said, there were people from the military. There were people from the government. There were people that we didn't know who were that came to the people that were talking about this, that saw this, witnessed this, were involved in this, and said, if you talk about this, your bones are gonna be found out in the desert sand. Jeez. And there are, if you'll go back and research the, the, um, the circumstances around Roswell and what people experienced, you'll find that threat coming up repeatedly over and over and over in, in the story of Roswell. So the, um, the one of the things that you have to deal with is, is that still forthcoming from the government? Are people still being hushed up and threatened by the government? So there's a lot to break through there besides just the secrecy. There's the threat. And it's, you know, you look at, um, like this woman told me, she said, you know, if, if you had a family, you may not care about yourself. You may be a brave son of a gun. You may say, yeah, bring it on. But you don't want your wife or kids hurt, you know? Right. So they know where to push the buttons, in other words. And so we have all these layers of things to get through, all this secrecy, all these threat levels, all of this stuff. And uh, it's, it's going to take a joint effort from a lot of us uh, to break through this and to get it done. But it's important enough that we should. We need to know what's going on. We do. John, this is all the time we have for today for Strange Paradigms. Oh. I this was <laughs> <laughs> this was awesome. But for those that enjoyed John as my guest, I do want to mention that I have interviewed him several times on yeah. Shifting the Paradigm. So, and I will place the links in the description box below for those that want to catch those interviews. And um, and along with, I will also place all of the show links and the chapters in the timeline index once this show is over. But also, you know, when we we definitely will have John back for future episodes of Strange oh, Paradigms because good. this went so great. Oh, it's fun. I love it. <laughs> Me too. So for before I let you go, where can people find you online and to find your books? Okay. Uh, if you want to learn more about me, go to johnrussell.net. That'll tell you more than you want to know. And uh, also on johnrussell.net, when my, my picture comes up there on either side of me, you'll see my book covers. You can click on those. It'll take you to Amazon where you can buy them. They're available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, a ton of mom and pop stores online, Walmart online carries them. So they're available. They're out there everywhere. And I can promise you one thing about my books. You've not read anything like this. I don't care how many books about the supernatural, paranormal, psychic realm, whatever that you've read. You've not read anything like these. You're going to enjoy them. And I would like to mention that all of his social media links and links to buy his book are also in the description box below. John, I'm going to bring you, I'm going to take you backstage and I'll see you in just a few. All right. Well, thank you for everyone watching today's show, Strange Paradigms. Let me know in the comments which story was your favorite that we covered today. I think all of them were my favorite today. I, I enjoyed every single one of them. Please make sure to subscribe. And now I am doing daily strange news YouTube shorts. So please check them out. Hit the like button because the likes drive them into feeds and search results to make the channel 
grow. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Mm -hmm.